So Shalom Aleichem, welcome to uh, Meaningful Interviews. I'm uh, Rabbi Chaim Dalfin, the host of the program, and today we have a very special guest, someone who I've actually been uh, hoping and waiting for uh, eagerly to come on the program, and you'll hear why in a moment. And this is Rabbi Yaakov Hamnik. Um, it's the first time that I'm meeting him, but uh, his brother, uh, I know from Borough Park, Kwan uh, Heights, and the family, and um, he's told me about you. And uh, recently a friend of his had ordered my book on Rabbi Hutner. Uh, Rabbi Hamnik's father was a Talmud Muvak, a prodigy student of Rabbi Hutner, the Tzadik Mavrocha, the Rosh Hashiva of Chaim Berlin. And uh, our Rabbi Hutnik, Rabbi, Rabbi Hamnik here, uh, I don't know if you were a Talmud Muvid, but uh, was also a Talmud of Rabbi, I believe of Rabbi Hutner, and uh, knows a lot about Rabbi Hutner. And being that I wrote this book, uh, the book uh, was sent to, uh, to, to Rabbi Hamnik here, and um, he's been reading it and commenting and has thoughts. And um, I wish I would have uh, spoken to you before I wrote it, but... Uh, like you said to me, uh, there's always another chance and a re uh, you know redo and things like that. And uh, let me get right to, right right to the point and uh, I'd like you to address this because you know I've written many many svarim, many books. I'm just a few, by the way. Rabbi Hamlik is a machaber svarim and Talmud Chacham, so um, an educated person. So I must say, out of all the books I've written. The only uh, book and group that gave me a kind of a hard time uh, were the Chaim Berliners. And uh, I was told before that they're very uh, secretive and, um, you know, trying to hide things uh, or, or that's the way it seems and it felt. And indeed, um, I met Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Shechter's son, Rabbi, I think, Mordechai Shechter of Aaron Shechter's son, I met him on the street. I was putting up some posters and he didn't know who I am. And I know I said, show me. He looks at the posters, Rabbi Hutner. And he says, oh, what's this? I said, it's a book about it. And what's your name? He said, Karl Bach. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry. He said, his name is Hutner. I said, Hutner? <laughs> So, you know, he was playing with me, but uh, he right away, you know, gave me the money, ordered the book, and then uh, I sent him, I'm sure he read it. But um, I, I, I got tremendous amount of orders from the biggest and most famous names in Chaim Berlin, which you and I both know, and it's no, we don't have to, you know, divulge that, uh, and it's private, of course. And um, they all read the book, you know, uh, I can't say that they're probably all happy, although I believe I presented what, based on my research and what I know, the, the fairest case. I wasn't coming there as a, you know, Lubavitcher hothead. I don't write that way, uh, although I'm a full-fledged Lubavitcher chassid. But, um, you know, I, I really try to be as objective as possible. And uh, Rabbi Hutner um, was, in my humble opinion, a good friend of the Rebbe's, although they had a disagreement at a certain point and they wrote back and forth letters about certain issues. But uh, at the end of the day, there was a derecheretz from each to the other. And it was unfortunate that, you know, my posters were torn down over and over. So, so um, rather than, you know, kind of, you know, fighting the system and they also blackmailed and threatened some bookstores, I don't want to go into it. It's, it's, the point is that I never had such an experience. So my question to you as rabbi, my question is, where, where is this coming from? And, and, and why is this? I mean, you know, before I get into the book, I, I really just want to, you know, talk it out so that uh, it, it, it's all open and hear your opinion. Well, let me give a little teeny hack down. Okay. Uh, uh, the foot and a that uh, that is no Lush and Hara, Legabi Gedoyla. Which is an interesting shita, because he uh, and he used to he said when he would tell it over to people, I heard it from people who heard it. From he used to say, "People have tainus on me." They say, "Yeah, yeah." 
that uh, that is counterintuitive. Uh, a man's a god, so that uh, that it makes the head to Alashanar. But he said that he held yeah because of the fact that it's like a political type of thing. You have to know who the Gedalim are, and you have to know uh, what their level is. And then later on, the Chazanish's letters came out. And in there, he, had, he writes that in a letter. And he says, Klai Yisrael is a koil das mihem gedolim. The Klai Yisrael has a right to know who the Gedalim are. So, so, uh, so Rehud was very excited when the letter came out. And he showed people, said, hey, I was saying it for years, and they were mocking me. And, and now you see the Chazanish said it. Now it's good. Anyway, so I'm, I'm sort of forced uh, to follow that here because I, mean, I want to have a policy of complete honesty. And, I, and, and here and there, if a person's name, is, it doesn't need to be said, I can leave it out. But basically, I'm not going to, uh, like Hachavoy, Sarah, like Perchus, I'm not going to put makeup on it. I'll tell you the way it is. There's miles that people don't, don't know. There's concerns that people don't know. You know, they, I'll, I'm going to try to answer your questions as honestly as possible. Now, when in Chaim Berlin, there was definitely a culture of uh, protectiveness. I wouldn't call it secrecy, but it was protectiveness. It was, a little bit was cultivated by Rufut himself, as you mentioned, I think one of the footnotes, because he used to tell people that he so individually and deals with each person can feed their Indian, that he said that anything I tell you I didn't tell anybody else. So mail it's a shekel to say over that I said it because it's not a gay to anybody else. So that standard, I, I, you know, I, he never said it to me. If he said it to me, maybe I would be bound by it. But he <laughs> never said it to me. I heard it from others. So i not have to believe it. But, but I do think that at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's our job. We collect what we hear from different companies. And man, we can, uh, some of the things you can tell yourself when you hear it, that it was individually based. And some things have definite general lessons, even if they are individual. So, so my policy is I'm not going to hold anything back. Uh, I, and I, I recognize there's a certain amount that is uh, secrecy within the yeshiva. Uh, my father himself didn't observe it too much. Uh, he, my father was very open about things, but there were certain things he didn't tell because my father had an unusual relationship with your father. Rosalina Freifold has a similar relationship, it seems like, where Rav Huntley used to mamish talk to him about Bachram and what he thinks the problem this Bachram has and why he's dealing with him a certain way. He, he, he would take him into the discussion. Then later he encouraged my father to become a psychologist. So if you put it together, it seems like he thought my father had a good intuition of where Bachram was holding. And so my father knew a lot more and he would reveal more, but he also... If a person was still alive or, or his children could be damaged by the information, he would right. withhold information. Right. So, so in continuation of that, what was Rabbi Hutner in the Eilam Atayra, in the Eilam of Gedalim, in the literature world? Oh, well, let, let, me, no, let, me, let me start with something else. Would you say Rabbi Hutner was more of a literature, a litvak? Or a chassid? Well, he was definitely part of his uh, mystique was that he tried to be a little bit of everything for everybody. So, so you know, if he played it that he wants to engage with all of Klai Israel, and uh, and so the yeshiva itself is a literature yeshiva in the sense that the yeshiva is here for for different Torah and to grow as a bent Torah. And uh, and other things like that, anything with a hyphen, the way he used to say, you know, I'm a I'm a Shiva Bach with a hyphen, chassid, a hyphen somehow. He's not in the hyphens. He's in the in the in the sense he's doing the job, trying to build the Shiva Bach and build the bent her and 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 stay within that. But he also uh, was very respectful and wanted to cultivate respect for all kinds of other movements. And and in a way, that was part of his critique against the Bavitch. Was that he felt they were they were too uh, centric, centric, egocentric, egocentric? Mean on the Rebbe? No, on the on their whole movement. You mean uh, uh, e e egocentric on their whole movement? That in other words, Narzay, Kanan, no one else, only them, and no one else. Well, 
take play the role of being like that Ramavino being the nice guy who's gonna help other people, but it's condescending. You know, it's with it, with it, with it, with it in, in the ten spheres, with the top sphere, and we also help the people below us. Okay, so, but didn't he, in a certain way, do it in his style, where he created a um, he created kind of a new genre of of Taita scholarship in it within a, him wearing a spodic and having these, uh, you know, Fabrengans or, or Titian, whatever you call them, it, didn't he kind of create that and really uh, wanted as many people to join that? Yeah, no question, but that, but we're sort of within the kind of 12 spot model, that was, this is our shape. And you and we and we invite you to join, uh, but I'll give you an ex I'll just give you an example. Nothing to do with Hasidim that I experienced. It was I grew up in Chaimblin. My father learned to Chaimblin. I was standing with my father once on the street corner, on Linden Boulevard, and uh, we lived in Rockway Parkway. And we were we had worked at Rabbi Life's shul, uh, so we were let's say at that moment I, I remember the, I envisioned it that we were at Linden in 96, 95th, something like that. And we were waiting for the light to change. And I asked him, is this Rav Hutner your Rebbe? You know, Abba, is Rav Hutner your Rebbe? So I was a little kid, eight years old. Baby. And he said, yes. And then he, you heard, you could hear a little bit of crying in his voice. And he said, and it's my dream and my wish that it should be your Rebbe too. <laughs> so, you know, it was a very powerful moment. And it sticks with me my whole life. So when I got to learn a Chaim Blin, I was very proud that for myself, but I was also proud I was able to live out my father's grief. Right. So why are you saying that? What's the so connection to what I was saying? Uh, no. So, okay. So tonight I wanted to share with you a, a thing that happened to me that really, so yeah, I, I was very uh, localized in that sense, that I grew up in Chaim Blin. My father had a disminning a Chalamoid. We would go one day to Lubavitch for Shafras and one day to Satan for Shafras, every Chalamud, because he wanted us to appreciate the whole spectrum of Kleister. And uh, and so, and I grew up very much in that mode. That's with my mode of thinking. I think it is till today, to a large extent. So, and I went to learn in another yeshiva that's in a different city. I, I don't even want to say the name, but, but uh, I went to learn this other yeshiva in another city. And they guys over there were so anti rebutna and they used to mock him. And they did it in front of me. They they didn't stare like <laughs> like they say in tells they, they didn't stare. Right. But they were doing it in front of me and I said to them, Rabbi said, you don't understand. There is only one yeshiva. Hashem has one yeshiva it has branches. There's branches here, there, here. Wherever Hashem needs a branch with a certain flavor. That's where it is. So that was that was my my you know. I mean, I said it spontaneously. I never heard that. Thing. I came up with it, but I think it expressed my you know. So that's how I was taught to look at the world. That there's all kinds of plays. Everyone does his chelik. There's twelve shvot, and, and then sometimes there's the yosef, and it's a challenge for the other eleven shvot to accept it, and they have to figure out how to you know how to digest it, like they say. But that's how I always was taught to look in terms of Clyde's road. Was Rabbi Hutner taken seriously by his contemporary Chavedim, the Gedele Yisrael, Rabbi Aaron, Rabbi Yankel, Rabbi Gifter, v'chulu, v'chulu, v'chulu. What was their real feeling about Rabbi Hutner? Well, he was a member of the Agudas Yisrael's Mayatzis Gedele Atara, and he didn't show up too often. Right. Um, but in 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 certain key moments, like when you, I mean, it's a little disrespectful to say this, but like you can say in a in a uh, uh, what they say in in like in politics, uh, a photo op. <laughs> when there was a photo op, like when, for example, when Menachem Begin came to visit the Gedolim in America, and they went to Moshe Feinstein's house, so what was there. Yeah. And he came with he came with sunglasses. Yes. And he and he said and he told people that it's because also the stock with Nay Rush. Uh, to me, I, I was I was a loyal Talmud. 
everyone, yeah, but I, I I was really put off by that. I mean, I, I, I couldn't digest it then. I still can't digest it now. It's but he did that. It was a little theatric. It was a little theatrical. I mean, there's no question about it. But so so I think that show, you know, it's sort of good done were open to him and, and the other and, and and they were open to him and they he was always invited to the meetings but i think they also had a little bit of awareness of him as as being a character a little bit of a character but they, oh. he was definitely in there Schlitt, they told me a story uh, i was sitting by him in camara uh, maybe 35 years ago. he told me this story that he said he, he uh, that they were going to a myasa term meeting and the Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, and so he was driving, Rabbi Yaakov was driving Rav Hut, and Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky asked for a ride. So they, they went and picked up Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. So now he's driving Rav Hut in the passenger seat, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky in the back seat. And, and they, they were supposed to go somewhere in Manhattan, they were, and Rav Hut was nervous about the address. So Rabbi Yaakov told them how to go, you go here, and back to and Rabbi Yaakov was famous that he studied the map in every city. He, he learned it up from the Gemara of that the Baki Shvili Derekia Kishvili Denado. Right. You see the after your Baki and Shvili Denado, that's Pasha. <laughs> that's his Rabbi Yaakov sheet then. He used to sit and study the map. He knew everything was. So Rabbi Yaakov told Rabbi Yaakov exactly how to go. And Rabbi was sitting there edgy. And then when they put, there was like a long red light with a cop directing traffic. And Rabbi Yaakov said, Frank, ask him how to go. <laughs> he made Rabbi ask direction to the cop. And the cop gave the same directions as Rabbi Yaakov gave. So after they pulled away, Rabbi Yaakov said, when as the guy is up, this is, this is good. <laughs> they gave him a little dig, you know. You couldn't trust me, I told you. you know. Okay, now you got it from the guys, but so, so, you know, it gives you a little bit of a flavor. There was, there was a little bit of tension between it with other and, and you know, but they, but they they he was one of that that he would he was an equal, so they they dealt with it. Well, um, would you say that he 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 understood a piece of Gemara Rashi Tesis and and the Mefarshim and a Rambam as well as they did? Did he have a good Hasbara? Or the, when he when he when he went into the world of machshava, maral, etc., he kind of um, he had less time and interest to focus on a hardcore piece of gemara. Would that be a true statement or not? Well, one of his talmidim, who was my age but who was much closer to him than I was. Uh, told me that I was maybe 23 years old, let's say. I'm, I'm now 64, so it's, it's a while ago. But also it takes 40 years to be on it, right? I'll die to the rabbit. Exactly. So but one of his, who was closer to him, than me, was more involved in keeping a relationship, said to me, he said it, uh, he said, there's no question that since he was being Isaac in, in this, the, he was putting less time in Kaifa Santa Nicola. So he wasn't holding something. That's what he said to me. Uh, but but on the, I'm, answer, I'm I'm not doing like the Mishnah says. I'll reach and reach and I'll and I'll because I'm, uh, uh, my memory is not as good. I, I tend to answer the last thing first. It's not as good. That's all right. The first and the first question that you point that you made in general, in in terms of his learning, so it's very very interesting. I think in this respect. Yeah, first of all, it was. A, a pretty solid London, but it didn't really, uh, and, and a little bit similar to Lavalter Rebbe, this kind of a respect. It was a solid London of a, of a sort, but a little bit with his own flavor. So he, 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 you couldn't really nail him down to a category. Um, I, it was among all my co Talmud and Chaim in my dar for sure, but I think I heard even from the dar before that nobody thought that he's giving over a derech halim. Because there were certain Rosh Hashivas who were famous. They, if you go to them, you get a derech halim. Right. So nobody felt that they're getting from him a derech halim. Now, the fact, but he would, the fact is, I'll tell you my own experience. I was 17 years old. 
but I was also three years out of high school because they, I was a little bit of a prodigy. It rushed me through high school. So I was 17 years old, my fourth, starting my fourth year base Madrid. Rav Hutner came back from Eretz Israel because he had the Machlech in base of Tom, and he came back for a couple of years. And well, what, year, what, what year are you talking about, 78? 75. 75. I was born in 58. Yeah. Okay. 75. And he's, uh, and the announce he's giving, sh- we were learning cool, and the announce he's giving Shan the fourth pair. So I, and I was starting towards the end, they said, you have to be 50 and higher. So I put my name on the list to go to make an appointment with him. And, uh, and they said, what well, what's the appointment about? I said, I want to uh, share a shikul title with the Rosh Shiva. And, and I want to ask to be allowed into the ship because uh, I was a year below the ship. And, uh, and I used the word that he really loved this word. I said, I have a hishtaki because to go to the ship. So that, was a, that word was a real selling word. And he, buzzword, and he made, a buzzword. It was a buzzword, but it made from the response I saw that it, it it hit home. So what he did for me was at that time was that he and I'll I'll tell you the story later in a different question. But just he let me into the shift. So I did hear shit from him for a year. It was already an older man, nineteen seventy five. He, he was nifted nineteen eighty. Yeah. But he he uh, this year was very good schmuck. It, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, solid in the same. In other words, like Rabbi Chef this year was, was always solid. I mean, it used to be very hard to listen to him years ago, then he get his Hasbara got better over the years. That's a whole interesting history of itself. You should live and be well. It, it, but but Rabbi Chef this year was always solid. And and everyone knew if you go to Rabbi Shaft this year regularly, you're going to become a big alarm. There's no question about it. He gave you a way of approaching things, of, of thinking about things. There's no question. And, and he has produced Tamidim that are big alarm. Rabbi also produced Tamidim that are big alarm, but not from him. It was like he, he got you to sort of find your own path. So it was a little bit of a different type of thing. But Rabbi uh, Nishi was very gishmak. And, and I'll tell you, like, we'd go down to the Spanish afterwards, and guys would be screaming about it for two hours after, back and forth, yelling. And uh, and so in terms, so I always felt, when people would ask me what a shit was like, I always said, it, if the matter of a shit is to train you how to think, it wasn't doing that. But if the matter of a shit was to put really interesting, intelligent, creative ideas out there, in the sugi that, that were worth talking about and worth knocking around, and then in the course of knocking around, you're going to get to understand the sugi better, and you're going to, you're going to, your own mind is going to be better, uh, you know, skilled at at debating deep things. That that was sort of the goal of the, of the share, and I felt that it was accomplished. Thank you. So his his machshav. We talk for a moment about his chidush, his uniqueness that he brought to the Yiddish world, to the Torah world in Olam HaMachshavu. And, and something that I, 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 I still don't have clarity, you know, I wrote about it, but I'm still thinking. Did he truly understand the Maharal better than anyone else? That learned Maral in the last hundred years, or is it open for interpretation? It seems to me, and from the, some of the Talmudim that I spoke to so far, that he felt and and led everyone to believe those that were part of his Machshava classes and Shmuzin that he was the biggest, greatest understander of Maharal. Uh, I could be completely wrong. What, what, what's your opinion? I never heard him say anything like that. that I'm the, you know, I'm the greatest living expert on the Maral. I, I never heard him say that. The, Im- the implication. Yeah, but you know, it. Uh, uh, I, I've written uh, twenty swarm on 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 Rashi on, on all the chefs, and uh, and I'm not going to go say I'm the, but I mean, but it's definitely deeply invested in that. In the morale, and and after he was nifter when when it, when they put out the book of his letters, 
It, this wasn't in the letters. This was in, in the uh, biography that his daughter wrote. Right. She, she has in there a, uh, a little diary entry after he went to the Morales Keva. And he talked about all his emotions as he stood at the Morales Keva. Yeah, yes. So, and so it's very powerful. So you could see clearly, and, and I'm saying I, I knew that more after this, after from reading the diary entry. But it clearly that he, he definitely felt that he had a, a special cash to the Divri mm -hmm. And uh, I heard from a fellow Talmud, I didn't hear from him, that he said that the morale had a different view of Kabbalah and the Arizal. That stuff is over my head. I'm not going to comment. But that's he said that. Some, that's what I was told that he said something like that. Uh, and I will, there's no question that a lot of times uh, when you're learning, if you learn Pach Yisak critically, you know, that, it's either my strength or my weakness that I learn everything critical. I, I don't give anybody a piss. And uh, and I'll tell you later about my relationship with Bob Trevor's turn in that, in that area. But the point is, uh, if you read it critically, sometimes I think like, wow, we really hit the bar out. He got it. You know, sometimes I'm like, well, in Kabbalah in the Kabbalah, I don't see the doors, but he's saying something that's very interesting. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I think the part that we could all agree on is that he worked very hard on the morale. There was a very, you know, it's a big time of he try He tried to get the Yusuf said in morale. He put a lot of interesting uh, analysis out there that's worth investing in, in trying to follow. And uh, did he mama shit the morale right on the head? Was it? Was the morale with David I, I don't know. I, I, I never got that exact feeling, but, but you know, maybe. Were more, were more of his Talmidim impacted by his machshava or by his uh, nigla, hardcore, gemara, you know, et cetera? Well, I heard that back in the day, uh, in my father's time, let's say. So he was more available to come in and talk a language with him. And uh, I also have a tremendous thing. When Rebbe Kohn Shlita put out his first body of Shulchan, I was living in Chicago at that time. I was 22 or 23 years old. And uh, and I saw- Wait, were you, you, you were at Tells? Yeah, I was in, uh, yeah, cause I, I got married and moved to Chicago uh, to be in, it worked out. So I, if once I'm in Chicago, I'm in Tells. I didn't go to Tells, I went to Chicago. <laughs> and I ended up in Tells. It's not show. Good. <laughs> no, I'm not as a show, but I'm just being honest. But the point was, uh, so I helped him sell a bunch of copies of Badi Shulcha, the first volume when it came out. And then he said to me, uh, listen, I have a car to tell you, what can I do for you to be made to you? Revival said. So I said, I heard that you have letters from Revolta and learning. Oh, by the way, that's also very valuable. Everybody should know this. Uh, this is a good opportunity for that. Revival Khan's first safe is called Das Coin. In the Das Coin Chalik Aleph, in the Chalik Base already, it seems like he had less day to day shacks with the foot. But in the Das Coin Chalik Aleph, the, I, I actually have a list on the inside title page. I can send you a, a scan of it. He has 11 or 12 pieces in Revolta's name, Gishmaka. And where he asked for the Kashim, but the Torah said, told him of Mahalach. Machlok's Rambi Marai, it's nice to say, it's something very interesting. I think you get more sense of his ability to learn from those pieces than almost anywhere else. Okay. It's well worth looking at. Uh, but, and so what Revival did for me was, he said, all right, it's a Turk, but I, I want to be made to do So he went and he photocopied all the letters that Revolta wrote to him. So I have saved up about 30 pages of letters and learning from a to a revival. I don't know how many of them are, are included in the, because they put out a safe for him. In the, in the safe is a current, they put out a, 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 a letters and learning. Right. So I don't know, I don't know how many of them are included in. But, and you, you could definitely see, you know, some real Londish skills. You could also see a little bit, every once in a while, a little bit of a Polish edge to it. And uh, but it, it's it's someone who knows how to learn as a baby and learning could really get a sense of him through those pieces. So what's the answer to my question? Who 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 
did his it, Machshava impact more Talmidim or his Nigma? Yeah, so I would say no question Machshava is much more and not even close. And, uh, and I would also say that the ones who were impacted by Nigla, it doesn't seem like from, through the Shiram, because I never had the experience, not even one time, but someone who told me that we're putting the Shiram on the wall, put me on my feet, and that's my whole Derech I never, ever heard that from any Chaim Balin of any age. But, as I said, with Revival, you see that he had this relationship where he's telling, where Revival's asking him, Lom Shikash, he said, he's telling him, Lom Shikash, very interesting. And, uh, and he had this relation. Now, my father himself told me that Revival was a Gavaldic uh, London, and, and my father had a, a big ability to answer Kashas, but he didn't have it. He didn't feel that he had an ability to ask Kashas because he didn't have the instinct to chop as a problem. So my father told me that he died. My father used to sit in the base Spanish at table away from Revival, and every time Revival would ask Chavus Akash, my father would eavesdrop. So you know, so Revival was very good at asking Kashas apparently, and and should live and be oil, and and he would he made, he established this relationship with Rufutin, and he got him to talk and learn with him on the Kashas, sometimes to write and learn with him. But I'm saying that was pretty rare. Most of the Salvation Shlita, who I haven't spoken to in thirty years, a tremendous guy. Uh, he told me also that uh, that he had letters from Rufutin. Uh, and but and also Tori used to talk about it, but he also had a learning kind of relationship with Ruhutna. So I think Ruhutna, it, it, but this is my assessment of it more that the way Ruhutna came to it he, was that he really he was mainly concerned with each Bach to relate to them in some kind of way. And there was a certain Bach where he decided the way I need to relate to this Bach is not work, that's where it, it'll work. But however, he got to that conclusion. We have the benefit of at least we have these right. letters and things that give us a nice Yerusha of, right. of his ideas and learning, which were very interesting, very and and pretty solid, you know, as far as that goes. Yasha Koyach, um, we'll end for now the first part of our interview, and Mitzvah uh, Shem will talk in a uh, we'll talk soon about our uh, your connection to uh, to Lubavitch or experiences with Lubavitch, and also. Uh, Rabbi, more about Rabbi Hutner and the Rebbe. Thank you very much. My pleasure.